sure I'm recording. All right, so we are back and I am kind of excited for this lesson. We're gonna close out the Septuagint today. I ended up adding more material. So I was gonna close it out last week, but then inevitably I decided that we still had more material to cover. That's not the one I wanted to get. I wanted this slide. So uh, we're gonna cover uh, more of the Septuagint today. Uh, last week, uh, I'm just gonna go over the latter part of the review last week. Last week, we talked about how certain textual variants and translation difficulties have been informed and followed because of the Septuagint. So we're gonna deal, uh, we dealt with last week a translation difficulty. And the translation difficulty we dealt with was in Isaiah 7, 14. And it was over the word uh, virgin here, which is represented by the CSB and the majority, the vast majority of English translations. Uh, but we talked about is uh, the Hebrew word behind that word virgin actually the word for virgin? And it's a little bit more vague than that. It's not quite specifically a virgin. Uh, it's a girl of marriageable age. Um, a, so a female who's able to be married, but is not yet married, right? Um, or potentially, she doesn't have to be married. She is a girl at the marriageable age. We don't have a specific word for that ourselves. Uh, that was the word, they had that word in Hebrew. Uh, so some translations like the RSV and uh, attempting to uh, retain the ambiguity that's in the Hebrew there, they chose the translation young woman. And this has become very controversial. Uh, in many circles, not just KJV only circles, but they are trying to maintain the ambiguity of the Hebrew. <clears throat> I even had um, a man this week, he sent me a, a excerpt from a theological dictionary that made the statement, uh, something to the effect of that you can't find uh, an example of Alma, that's the Hebrew word there, meaning something other than a virgin. And, and what I want to say, two things there. One, I don't think that's uh, correct. But secondly, uh, I want to be careful with using theological dictionaries that don't give sources for their information. Uh, I think it's better to use um, lexicons. Lexicons are, are better. They generally give you sources of where they're pulling that information. So <clears throat> Alma here, uh, you, as you can see, they... They're, they give you scripture verses here for what this person could be, but they also give you other places, other commentaries that are dealing with it, other sources here. So a good lexicon and a good dictionary is going to tell you where these definitions are coming from. And one of the definitions, I didn't mention it last week, but it's worth mentioning, is that Alma a girl of marriageable age, a girl who is able to be married, but maybe not necessarily married, and also a young woman until the birth of her first child. So she could be an Alma all the way until she gives birth to her first child. So she would not necessarily be a virgin in the case. So there is some, uh, not necessarily, she definitely wouldn't be <laughs> uh, a virgin in that case. And the RSV is attempting to retain some of that ambiguity. I was also talking to the pastor last week, and I think this is also the case that uh, in many prophecies, when you're studying prophetic works in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, you're going to see a, um, a twofold fulfillment of the prophecy. One's going to be usually in the immediate, and then one's going to be in the long term. And so if you're reading Isaiah, you're going to see there is a child that is born immediately in his day that people see. And uh, so the ambiguity of the word Alma there might have been intentional uh, in order to demonstrate the fulfillment of the prophecy, both in the short term and in the long term, being Mary, the long term fulfillment of this prophecy. So there's some of that there. Um, I think it's good. It's good to get the pushback. I appreciated his um, him messaging me and, and bringing that up. Uh, but uh, that's that. And so because the Hebrew word does have some ambiguity there, um, the RSV attempts to maintain that. However, there is no ambiguity at all in the Greek. The Greek word, sorry, here I lost my mouse, there we go. The Greek word behind uh, this verse 
in the in the Septuagint is virgin. It's indisputed. It it doesn't. Uh, there's no other meaning it could have. And and so most uh, virgin most translations follow the Septuagint there in its unambiguousness, in its exactness. And as you can see too, uh, that is what also that is also what Matthew did. So this is Matthew 1, 22 and 23. Matthew also followed the preciseness of the interpretation of Alma here. And so I think we're totally legitimate to follow the preciseness as well. Uh, I do think virgin is the right choice and it's informed by our understanding of the Greek. So I think that's both there. All right. Um, and then that was pretty much, I think that's where we left off last week. We didn't get any further than that. So now we're going to get into, so that was a translation difficulty that helped us understand what exactly uh, Alma might have meant. And, and keep in mind too, Alma, I said this last week and I still stand by it and it's correct, is that Alma has the idea that it's a young woman of marriageable age. If you're a young woman of marriageable age that has a baby and you're not baby, you're not <laughs> married, uh, then you are probably going to get stoned. So uh, that's not the context here. So virgin would have been uh, totally applicable, culturally speaking. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about another one. Uh, we're going to get into some good detail here. This is a textual variant uh, that we're going to get into. So now Psalm 2216. If we read Psalm 2216 from the CSB, again, the CSB, representative of nearly all English translations, not all of them, but the majority of them, says um, in 2216, for dogs have surrounded me, a gang of evildoers has closed in on me, they pierced my hands and feet. And for those of you who are familiar, most of you recognize Psalm 22 immediately is a messianic psalm. It, uh, it, it uh, means that it's a prophecy about Christ. And if you're familiar with this verse, you're very familiar that this is a direct reflection of what will be the crucifixion. They pierced my hands and feet. You can't read that and not think crucifixion. Or can you? So let's go further. Let's. I'm going to show um, two translations here. And to show two translations, one is the MEV, and the other is the JPS Tanakh. And so, for the lack, for the for the purpose of clarity, the MEV is a Protestant translation. Okay, it's done by people who believe the same things we believe. Okay, the JPS Tanakh is done by Jewish people. They do not believe the same thing we believe. And I wanted to put both up on the screen just to demonstrate that this isn't a bias necessarily of the Jewish people. I do think it is a bias, of, but there's a, there's a reason this bias exists. So if we read the MEV, it says, For dogs have encompassed me. The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me. Like a lion, they pin my hands and feet. Notice it doesn't say they pierced my hands and feet. It's, it's different here. And there's a whole nother... Subject noun here, like a lion. Okay, this one's very interesting. Now, uh, I'll actually circle back to that. The JPS Tanakh, okay, remember this one's done by Jews. Dogs surround me. A pack of evil ones uh, closes in on me. Like lions, they maul my hands and feet. And so what is going on here? Why is this like a lion showing up in these two translations, but it is not showing up in Pretty much, I, I'm willing to bet none of your Bibles right now have the word lion in this verse. All right? I'm willing to bet because there's only a handful of translations that actually represent the Hebrew here. And so let me just go and give you the next uh, understanding here. So we're going to pull in the Septuagint. We're going to pull in the Septuagint now, the LES. All right. That's the Lexham English Septuagint. So we have the CSB. They pierced my hands and feet. MEV. Like a lion, JPS to, uh, Tanakh, like a lion, or like lions in this case, and Septuagint, they pierce my hands and feet. So notice the Greek here does not ha also have the word lion. All right. And so um, I need you to understand what's happening in the Hebrew here. In the Hebrew, 
Uh, I'll show the Hebrew text in a moment, but in the Hebrew, there is, uh, there is a, the phrase there is like a lion, my hands and feet. Okay. So look at the JPS for a moment. You see these brackets around they maul, like a lion, they maul my hands and feet. In the Hebrew, there is no verb. The brackets here are similar to the use of italics in the KJV or um, brackets and other translations. They are the way that the translators are indicating to you, we've added words to smooth out the reading. We've added words to smooth out the reading. And they do, they smooth out the reading. Like lions, they maul my hands and feet. Without those brackets, the English is almost impossible to understand. Like a lion, my hands and feet. Like a lion, my hands and feet. And it's just as uh, difficult to understand in the Hebrew. It's not like, oftentimes when you add these words, it's implied in the Hebrew, but it's not It's not necessarily there. Like if you knew Hebrew, it's. it, it would be the similar if I said, um, uh, what do we have? We have the understood you. If I said, go to the store. We have an understood you in the front of that. It's not in the English word, but maybe another language can't interpret that directly and needs a subject. And so they would put you in brackets or in italics because it's understood in English, even though the word isn't actually there. Oftentimes that's what brackets and italics are doing. They're giving you an understanding that's not there in the original language, but if you knew the original language, you would understand the implications. But that's not what's happening here. There is no verb there, and it's just as awkward in Hebrew as it is in English to say, like a lion, my hands and feet. What does that mean? Does that mean my hands are like lions, like they're super strong and powerful? Does it mean that uh, they pin my hands and feet? That is an interesting reason why the MEV goes in that direction, but I'm not going to tackle that right now. Or does it mean they maul my hands in uh, my hands and feet? Because what do lions do, right? What do lions do? So this is really interesting that like a lion is showing up here. And so the way, and, and notice in the Greek, the word lion does not show up. It's not there. And it's not there in the majority of our English versions. They pierced my hands and feet. So what is happening? What is going on here? I'm going to show you the Hebrew. And uh, the Hebrew is going to give is going to inform you as to why we have these vastly two different translations. They pierce or like a lion, because that's the difference. That's what we're looking at. They pierce or like a lion. My hands and feet are the same. Okay, both translations reflect my hands and feet, but it's either they pierce or like a lion. All right, so here's the Hebrew. All right, so if you were to back translate the Septuagint into the Hebrew, it would look like this, okay? All of these words are identical. The difference here is the Masoretic text is a later, most, uh, most of our Old Testaments are based off the Masoretic text. We haven't got there yet in how we received our Bibles. Um, we'll get to it later. It's a, a later text. And one of the things that the Masoretic text has that's unique to it uh, up to this point in history is they added vowel points, okay? So prior to the Masoretic text, vowel points didn't exist. So I left the vowel points off to represent how the Hebrew would look during the time of the LXX had it been translated backwards. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so you'll notice though, all of the consonants are identical all the way through. Okay, and then I just highlighted for us the phrase in question. So if we look at it, we've got, uh, let's see if I remember my Hebrew alphabet here. We've got kaf, aleph, resh, wow, yod, wow, daleth, uh, sorry, yod, daleth, yod, yod, daleth, yod, okay? All right, those are the Hebrew letters there. You notice there's one letter that's different, one letter that's different. We have a wow, and we have a yod, all right? And so that is... Uh, if you were to pronounce these words, I'm gonna do my best. Sorry if I butcher this, but it would be the difference between saying something to the effect of ka'ari, that would be they pierce, and ka'aru, like a lion. That is a one letter difference. The bottom letter 
as a yod makes that that section of letters there like a lion. If you have a wow there in the same spot, then you have they pierce. Okay. Now here's the thing: we don't have uh, much in the when when you're when you're a Hebrew translator and you come across a translation difficulty at this point. Because that's what this is at this point, is a translation difficulty. Like a lion, my hands and feet. You're like, what does that mean? How do we interpret that? Well, good translators will go to other translations and see how they handle it. And so they go to the Septuagint. They go to the Septuagint and they say, oh, Septuagint understands this as they pierced. And now if you know your language really well, you're like, oh, it's a one letter difference between the two. It's a one letter difference between this making sense and this making no sense. Also, when you look at the letter, it's the difference between how long the stem is on the letter. How long is the stem? So if you come down hard, you have a wow and you get they are pierced. If you come down short, you short stroke it, you have a yo and you have like a line. And so you can see easily as a, a person who's looking at the Hebrew, how this could happen easily a guy who's writing the scribe. And so Pastor talked about this two weeks ago. I was going to cover it last week, but two weeks ago, Pastor covered something of this nature in Ecclesiastes, where he was dealing with a textual variant. Um, and he, he showed us the two Hebrew words that impacted the phrase. And he showed us that it came down to the word for uh, the letter for calf and the letter for Beth. Okay. And the difference is this tittle right here, right? If they curve the line a little hard, you get a calf and you have a different word. If you don't curve the line and you get you put your straight stick here, you get a beth. And so this would be easily to uh, easily misunderstood. Now I can give you kind of an example as best as I can how this might work in English. Our lowercase o and our lowercase a are very similar, right? Just a little stick. And I know I have bad handwriting, so. If I were to write something and I said something to the effect of uh, my cot was stolen. Now, by itself, my cot was stolen, having no context, uh, makes perfect sense by itself. But I could have just as easily have said my cat was stolen. My cat was stolen. And uh, you need more context to know if I meant my cat or my cot. And so maybe you might think that uh, in in my context, if you're reading more, I'm a homeless guy. And you find out that I said something to the effect of um, without my cot, which was stolen, sleeping is very uncomfortable, right? And you might say, oh, that makes perfect sense. He's talking about a bed. However, I could have also said, because he kept me warm or because it kept me warm. And you might say, oh, it's his cat. His cat sleeps with him. And now you have a textual variant in which you're not sure which way to go. They both make total sense, uh, depending on the context and how you understand it. So some people might interpret what I'm saying as it's his cat. He had a cat. It was stolen. It kept him warm. And now he can't sleep. Or it's his cot. It's all he had. It was his only bed. It kept him warm. And now he can't sleep. And so you end up with two translations of what I've said based on whether or not I said cat or cot, whether that line is there. Now, the difference between the example I just gave you, that example fits really well with pastor's uh, situation, but not so much with mine, because mine doesn't make any sense in one of them, right? If I had used a uh, cot, it's clearly all about a cat, and then all of a sudden I mentioned a cot in my situation, like this doesn't fit contextually. He must have meant cat. And so uh, the scribe must have meant cat. And so that's what's happening here in the Hebrew. We have... We have a phrase that doesn't make sense, like a lion, my hands and feet, or they pierced my hands and feet, okay? And so this debate, the one I'm telling you about between Jews who do not want to affirm that this is about Jesus and the crucifixion, or atheists, I deal with this with atheists too. Atheists don't want to affirm that this is about Jesus and the crucifixion. They will say the Masoretic text says the Hebrew text says, like a lion, my hands and feet. And Christians have changed it over time uh, to say they pierced my hands and feet. And a sort of conspiracy theory. This doesn't work because the Septuagint predates um, Christianity. 
And so Jews were the ones who actually did the Septuagint. Now, granted, uh, it's harder to prove that uh, based on manuscript evidence. You would have to suggest that it was changed intentionally or that the uh, textual variant there. But this has been going on for centuries. For many, many centuries, Jews and Christians have debated this verse on whether or not it is uh, talking about Christ because of this textual variant. So much so uh, that it's never been settled. Nearly every single Christian Bible represents they pierced, almost all of them. There are some that do follow the Hebrew. The MEV, I just want to go back there real quick. Let me see here. Uh, the MEV, if you read their preface, the MEV is careful to say that they are prioritizing the Hebrew text over everything else. So if the Hebrew text gets it wrong, they're going to cop, they're going to translate the Hebrew text. Okay. If the Hebrew text, uh, if the Greek text gets it right. So they followed the Hebrew. They very much followed the Hebrew. Almost everybody else throughout Christian history, traditionally, and in almost all of our English translations, we all follow the Septuagint. We follow the Septuagint on this verse. And we've had to debate for years, whether or not that was correct, all the way up until the 1960s. In the 1960s, so we're talking about, what, 70 years ago, roughly? In the 1960s, we've discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found this verse. We found this verse in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so... Uh, let's look at what Psalm 22 looks like on a fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is a fragment. Uh, here we go. This is the fragment. It's been, I couldn't find out who enhanced this, but it's been enhanced a little bit for our benefit. Um, but you can see the original online too. I just preferred the, the enhanced one, so it was easier for you to see. Um, but I couldn't figure out who did it, so I can't credit them. A whole bunch of websites were using this picture. Uh, so... And no one was telling me where it came from. So now I'm among that bunch that <laughs> is using the picture without credit. I apologize to whoever did it. Anyway, they found this scrap, Psalm 22 and the Nahal Hever. Okay, that's the fifth, sixth column, uh, 11, fragment nine, with the line under investigation from Psalm 22 enhanced. So it's just a fragment and we have it. And we have the verse, the phrase in question. And so if you look, we've got, Taf, Aleph, Resh, wow. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have what the Greek has, not what the Masoretic text has. And for, for point of comparison, the Masoretic text was completed sometime around 1000 AD, and the Dead Sea Scrolls are dated about the second or third century BC. So we're talking about roughly a 1,200 year difference between what the Masoretes wrote and what the Hassines wrote in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this weighed heavily, weighs, I should say weighs heavily that the Greek Septuagint got it right and that Christians have been getting it right from the beginning, that this was actually in Hebrew originally as they pierced. However, if you think, and some circles do. If you think the Masoretic text is perfect, down to the jot and tittle, your translation should reflect what the MEV says, which is like a lion. But since most people don't have that in their translation, it's they pierced, they got it from the Greek. They looked at the Greek and said, we think this is short stroked. This should be a wow. And that's as simple as that. So that is how the Greek Septuagint has impacted our reading of Psalm 22 for nearly 2,000 years without Hebrew evidence for it, but we had strong Greek evidence for it. And we followed the Septuagint. And I think that is pretty awesome <laughs> that we have gotten it right this whole time. Although we have been in this debate this whole time, this is very satisfying to see this result. Now, just like things go, this didn't solve the debate. There are still, the debate is still ongoing. It's just now we have far more weight on our end to show the unreasonable position of people who disagree 
with like uh, uh, with uh, they pierced as opposed to like a lion. And so I find this fascinating. I love it. And we'll continue. So um, for nearly two millennia, the Septuagint has influenced our Bible both in structure and in interpretation. The Septuagint has been very impactful. Uh, how we refer to God's divine name as the Lord comes from the uh, Septuagint. Uh, it helps us with textual variants. It's helped us with translation difficulties. And honestly, I praise God for his preservation of the Septuagint. Now, I don't hold it as more authoritative than the Hebrew, but I do think it's very impactful on how we understand our Hebrew. And so I think the Septuagint is a necessary part of understanding our Old Testament. If you're reading your Old Testament and you've never engaged with the Septuagint, I don't blame you. You probably haven't been taught to do so. And it's only within the last hundred years or so that non-Greek speakers have had access to the Septuagint, right? We got our first, uh, I think we've got our first widely published Septuagint in 1844. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I think there might've been one English Septuagint before that. I don't have access to it and I don't know how impactful it was, uh, how well received it was either. Um, but I do think as English speakers, so I would imagine most people here, you can raise your hand if, if I'm wrong about this. Most people in here don't speak Greek. Right? Does anyone in here speak Greek fluently? That you could pick up a Greek manuscript, read it, and tell me what it said? I can't. And I would imagine, yeah, it looks like none of us in here can either. So how would we access the Greek Septuagint uh, if we can't speak Greek? Uh, I say Greek Septuagint. It's repetitive. The Septuagint is Greek. Uh, well, we have English translations today, and I want to I want to introduce you to those English translations. I think they're beneficial for us, and we should be using. And so, but in order to give you some understanding of how we got these English translations, I need to give you a little history. So we're going to talk about. Remember, early in the beginning of the class, I said I'm going to use the phrase "the Septuagint." even though there isn't just one Septuagint, right? I said that in the beginning, I still use the Septuagint. It's just much clearer to talk that way than to say the Septuagint or something of that nature. Uh, it's less ambiguous, but I wanna give you some history. I wanna show you that there are differences, all right? And so these are what I would say are probably like 10 categories, if you will. Maybe there's a better way to say that. Nine manuscripts and then a 10th category. Maybe that's the best way to say it of the Septuagint that we have available to us, not necessarily in, in fullness. Okay, so not all of these are actually, almost none of these are the complete Septuagint from front to back. There's missing pieces in, in all of these, some less than others. So we have Codex Sinaiticus, all right, which it has the Greeks, which has the Septuagint, I'm gonna keep repeating myself, the Greek Septuagint, which has the Septuagint in uh, the Old Testament, Codex Alex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, uh, Aquila, Theodotion, Symmachus, Codex Cotinanius, Codex Marcellanius. I'm butchering some of these, I'm sure. Codex uh, Caistianus, and then other fragments and quotes that aren't necessarily categorized like these. We don't know where they came from. Uh, in the early church, the church fathers, many of them read and quoted from the Septuagint. So that's what I mean by fragments and quotes. So we'll, we might have a small fragment here or there that we know is the Septuagint, but we don't know where it belongs necessarily. So it's just a cat, it's just a um, fragment. And then we have quotes. We have the church fathers quoting the Septuagint frequently. And we have New Testament quotes that are also representative of the Septuagint. Uh, so we have all of these quotes that don't go in a particular codex or a manuscript or something of that nature. They're just quotes. And then we have um, Origen. If you guys don't remember, I've, I've mentioned Origen a couple of times. In Origen's day, uh, there were people reading different Septuagints. Okay, there are different Septuagints. And he took all of this, the most widely used Septuagints of his day, and he put them in one volume called the Hexapla. And a Hexapla meaning six, Hexa meaning six. And so the first column on the Hexapla was the Hebrew. Okay, because it was seen as authoritative. The second column on the hexapla was the Hebrew transliterated into Greek. 
So just remember, tran not translated, transliterated. Each Hebrew letter was replaced with a Greek letter representing that sound. Uh, then the third through the sixth column were different Septuagints that were being used in that day. The third column, I believe, was um, Aquila's translation. And then the fourth column was Symmachus's translation. The fifth column was just called the Septuagint. It was the most popular uh, Septuagint of its day. And then the sixth column was Theodosian's uh, Septuagint. So what he did is he put them all together side by side in one Bible. It was a parallel Bible of Hebrew and Greek with all of the major versions put next to each other so you could see the differences. And that's what he did. And so uh, what if you look at manuscripts and you do any study of this kind, what you're going to learn is that there are no two manuscripts that are identical. All manuscripts are snowflakes, and not in the liberal sense, but in the sense that they're all unique. Okay? They're all snowflakes. Every, uh, every manuscript is unique. It's got a textual variant in it somewhere. It's just impossible not to have it. And so by lining all of these up like this, uh, those readers back then could see the differences. And I say that because those readers back then had access to it. We don't. Origins Hexapla does not exist anymore today. Unfortunately, we have no extant copies of it. We don't know exactly what it looked like. All we know about it is what Origin tells us, what Eusebius tells us, and what other quotes tell us about the Hexapla. But we don't have it. So we know what it looked like. We know what it contained because we have people describing it and telling us. Uh, but we just don't have any manuscripts anymore. However, we do have fragments or whole copies of all of these manuscripts that I listed on the screen. So we know what's in the hexapla, but we just don't know how origin would have identified textual variants or things of that nature. We just don't have that. So that's unfortunate. And so um, as I move along here, today we have essentially three Septuagints, three Septuagints. Okay, we have all of these different ones behind us, but we have done work and we have what we what I would call mon, modern versions of the Septuagint. Modern in the sense that we've done some work. So let me explain what we mean by that. Uh, you guys probably don't know all of these terms. So some of these terms are going to uh, get repeated throughout the class and they'll get more explanation as we go. So if you feel a little lost, that's OK. We're going to talk about it, but we have modern texts today, too. You might have heard the Nessel Allens text. You might have heard the UBS text or the Textus Receptus or the Byzantine text or something of that nature. Those are all modern words to describe the ancient manuscripts put into redone in a modern day. They're just redone. We've done work. Well, we have the same thing for the Septuagint. And so with the Septuagint, we have two categories of uh, of works completed today. For the Septuagint, our three best, come on, our three best manuscripts are Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrius, and Codex Vaticanus. These three here are the uh, most complete, beginning to end, with the least amount of missing material. And of those three, Codex uh, Vaticanus is considered the most reliable and the earliest manuscript that represents the Septuagint. And so when we're doing work today and we're trying to reproduce the Septuagint, we're trying to find out exactly what the Septuagint might have said in its original form, uh, there are two ways people go about it, okay? The first way is the diplomatic way, the diplomatic way. And the diplomatic way is essentially this. We've identified that Codex Vaticanus is probably the best representation of what uh, the original Septuagint might have looked like, its renderings. And so what the diplomatic method is, is we're going to just reproduce, see if I can do this. We can just reproduce Codex Vaticanus. And then the places where Codex Vaticanus is just hard to read, maybe because of wear and tear, maybe because of worms having eaten through the page, we're going to go through the other manuscripts and try our best to determine what goes in that missing spot or a missing section. And so generally speaking, a diplomatic 
LXX today is just going to reproduce Vaticanus with and use the other manuscripts to fill in the missing parts that we're not sure what they mean or say. And so that's the diplomatic. The eclectic method, on the other hand, is going to look at all of the available evidence, all of it, and say, we're going to try to reproduce the original Septuagint as best as we can using all the available evidence. So we're not just going to pick one manuscript necessarily and reproduce that one and fill in the missing pieces. We're going to look at it all. We're going to apply some methods. We'll talk about textual criticism methods later, but we're going to apply those methods uh, to this and we'll end up with an eclectic text. So it's a text that's going to take readings from different manuscripts that say this makes the best sense for what would have been most likely the original reading. And so you end up with an eclectic. And then when you work on those two, you end up with a manuscript when you're done and you are not a manuscript because they're not manuscripts anymore. They're not handwritten. You end up with a result when you're done. You end up with a copy of the Septuagint, a printed copy, and you attach a name to it, usually your own when you've done the work. And so we end up with these names. So in the diplomatic uh, method, you're going to see something like sweets. Septuagint, Sweet's Septuagint, Sweet, and a partner of his worked through this uh, diplomatic method, and you see Sweet's. The eclectic method, uh, you'll see something uh, like Ralph's, Ralph's Septuagint, okay, at the bottom there, Ralph's Septuagint, or the Gottagen uh, Septuagint. Now, the Gottagen Septuagint is still a work in progress, as I understand it. They're still doing it. They haven't completed. I think they have um, 24 volumes of the... Old Testament done, but they haven't finished it. So there's still more to do. And I don't know how many books are in a volume or something of that nature. I know, I think the Torah has been done. I don't know what's missing. But Gottagen is a work in progress. As, as I understand it, it's still being worked on. And Ralph's is, is done. It's complete. It's older. And so uh, these are essentially what we would say three standardized versions of the Septuagint. Sweet, Ralph's, and Gottagen. And that's important because as you start working through English um, English translations of the Septuagint, they will tell you what uh, whether they were diplomatic or eclectic and whether they used Ralph's or Sweets. Okay, so I'm going to run through four. I'm going to try to do this very quickly so we can end the class on this because I don't want to continue the Septuagint next week. I want to be done. So let's go through this very quickly. Uh, the first one on the list for an English Septuagint, okay, is Brenton's Septuagint. It's a diplomatic. They worked with Sweets, okay, Sweets Septuagint. They translated it in 1844. Because it was translated in 1844, you have older scholarship. You know, they haven't, they didn't know all the things we know today necessarily. Some might say that's better. Uh, some say it's worse. I go with the worst side. I think we have more information and it's valuable. Um, it's also an older English, okay, 1844. There wasn't a lot of other options. So uh, Brenton chose to translate the Septuagint in the style of the KJV. So when you're comparing the Septuagint to uh, a translation, this one pairs very well with a KJV translation. And I have used this for many years um, to compare what the Septuagint might read versus what the Hebrew might read as reflected by the KJV, okay? Um, in it, you're going to have um, the Greek in the middle, which is going to be useless to you guys because none of us read Greek. Uh, but on the outer columns, you'll have the English. And so you have Brenton's English uh, uh, Septuagint on the sides, which is very helpful. Okay, And if you know Greek well enough, you might be able to pair up some of the words. Okay, um, This is probably one of the least helpful English translations of the Septuagint, in my opinion, unless you want to compare it to the KJV. For that niche region, I use this frequently because uh, I'm that's what I'm doing almost all the time. Oh, and another nice thing about this too uh, is that this is public domain now. So you can usually find this for free on the internet. You can buy a physical copy like this, but you can also find free versions online oftentimes. Uh, all right, so... Uh, because it's a diplomatic translation, and this is going to be true across the board with diplomatic translations, um, you're not going to get a lot of textual variant footnotes because they're reflecting Codex Vaticanus. They're not interested in all the other manuscripts and the textual variants that exist there uh, unless they are 
running into a part where vaticanus is missing and they need to to fill it in somewhere so very few textual variants next one is the orthodox study bible the orthodox study bible uh, this is a complete bible with the new testament in it uh the old testament is uh saint athanasius's academy septuagint okay this is a translation it is eclectic they used ralph's primarily okay and uh this was published in 2008 it is done in the style of the nkjv and this is really important because the greek orthodox people are to the septuagint what KJV only is, are to the KJV. They believe it's perfect. The Septuagint is perfect. Um, and they believe the Byzantine tradition is the tradition that they should be using. The Byzantine tradition consists, we'll talk about the New Testament later, but it consists, consists of the Byzantine tradition of the Greek text. And the Byzantine tradition is the Septuagint of the Old Testament. Um, what's nice about this is that uh, it's written in the NKJV, format so the style of the nkjv so it's going to have modern english it's going to be easier to understand and also it's going to have study notes in it because it is a study bible its study notes are going to reflect greek orthodox theology uh, and things of that nature so understand what you're getting when you get this i bought this primarily so i could read the septuagint in an nkjv format uh, but there is a nice feature in here that i also use it for if you're familiar with the church history esv or the ancient faith csb uh, the Orthodox Study Bible also has a lot of quotes in it from the early patristics on the eastern side. So guys like Chrysostom, Basil, um, uh, who else? Cyril. Uh, all of those guys uh, on the eastern tradition, they get receive a lot of quotes in here, and you'll get articles and stuff like that. So I use that for that purpose. It's helpful in that way. Um, not a lot of textual footnotes, though. Even though this is an eclectic version, they're not giving you a lot of uh, how they came to their conclusion. Okay. Next one is the Lexham English. The Lexham English Septuagint. The Lexham English Septuagint is by far the most beautiful edition of the Septuagint in English today, in my opinion. Uh, not only is it beautiful on the outside, it's beautiful on the inside. It's got a great, easy to read reader's format. They put the pericopes on the outer column. Uh, so they don't actually interrupt the text. So it's a really good reader's version. If you want to sit down and just read the Septuagint as, as it is, as it flows, without necessarily the purpose of study per se, you just want to read it, by far there isn't a better edition of the Septuagint than this one. Uh, the Lingu uh, English, Lexham English Septuagint was, this is the second edition, which was completed in 2020, so just a few years ago. Uh, the first edition was done before that, but the second edition is the only one in print. Yeah, if you want a first edition, it's digital only. Uh, it's in the style of the Lexham English Bible, which you've heard Pastor mention from the pulpit. Um, I use it. It's definitely on the more formal side. It's written in that way, but it is by far, I think, of all of the Septuagints, the easiest one to read both in uh, its format and uh, other ways. Um it is diplomatic, so there's not a whole lot of textual footnotes, almost none to speak of. There's a few in there, but they're not enough to, to say that they're actually valuable. So this is primarily good to read. All right, definitely read from that. And then uh, lastly, the last one here is the, a new English translation of the Septuagint. This has nothing to do with the other Bible by the same name, the Net Bible, uh, though they share the same name. Uh, the Net Bible and the NETS, the NET and the NETS are totally different. There may, I didn't check, there may be some overlap in the translators, but completely different projects. All right, uh, this um, is an eclectic translation, and it's an eclectic, it's a truly eclectic translation in the sense that they didn't follow even one of necessarily the eclectic versions, okay? They looked at Gottingen, they looked at Ralph's, they looked at all the manuscripts themselves, and they made decisions and they put in footnotes as to to help you understand why they made those decisions. They published this in 2007. It's in the style of the NRSV. The NRSV is not a translation I typically recommend. I will get into that later. But for things of this nature, where we're just trying to compare uh, what might be read in the Hebrew via the NRSV and what might be read in the Greek via the NRSV, I think this is totally fine. Um, so this is written in the style of the NRSV, and this by far 
has the best textual. Uh, oh, sorry. You know what? I want to go back to slide real quick because I didn't talk about this. Contains alternate text, that last slide. Uh, especially in the Apocrypha, sometimes we have two editions of the same book of the Bible. So if you go to the back of the Lexham English Bible, you'll have uh, Tobit in the Apocrypha, because the Apocrypha exists in here. You have Tobit in the Apocrypha, and you have Tobit B in the back of the Bible, which is a different rendering in the Greek. We have two, they're, they're different enough to get their own books. They have Tobit A and Tobit B and a couple other books like that. Well, the same is true for the New English translation of the Septuagint. You also get multiple texts, but you get far more of them. For example, if I open this up and I go to the book of Judges, um, well, this is a two-column text as opposed to a single-column text. So in a two-column text, just traditional reading is still paragraph mode, but you'll notice there's no line in the middle for people online. Sorry, you can't see the book that's in my hand. There's no line in the middle. When you go to the book of Judges and other places, you're going to see that there's a line in the middle there. Okay between the two columns. That is so you can see Judges A and Judges B side by side. You can see the two columns and you can see where they differ. Uh, so this is, in my opinion, if you wanna study the Septuagint in English, all right, this is by far the best one. It not only has the best textual footnotes, it also has book introductions that give you the history of that book in the Septuagint because the Septuagint wasn't all translated at the same time. I'm going over, I'm trying to finish here. Um, the translated all at the same time, the Torah was, but the rest of it was not. And so there are different translation philosophies of each book of the Bible. Some are more formal, some are more functional. The introduction of each book will tell you, is this book more formal and more functional? And then the translator of that book will also tell you that he's going to attempt to reproduce the translation philosophy of the original translator. And so he's if the original translator was very formal, this translator of the Septuagint will also be very formal, very word for word. If it was more functional, they will be more functional. And so uh, they give you that information at, at the front of the book. If you're going to study the Septuagint deeply and you're going to study your Hebrew, I think that is by far uh, the best one. It is the most useful one. It's the one I grab most often. Um, so just real quick, wrap up. These are the four uh, versions of the Septuagint. I'm going to put them on the back table back there so you guys can uh, take a look at them. Uh, but you have the Brenton, Diplomatic, Orthodox Study Bible, Eclectic, Lexham English, Diplomatic, NETS is Eclectic. They're all helpful. If you can get all four, I recommend it because I think multiple translations are always helpful uh, to deal with translation difficulties and things of that nature and textual variants. And so I think that's as far as I'm going to go today on this. I've run out of time. I've gone over. So you all are dismissed. Thank you.